On today's show, how soon should Rosetta 2 die? New MacBook Pros as reference monitors and some of the coolest cushions you've ever seen. Seriously. Turns out that these MacBook displays aren't just pretty, they have XDR modes just like Apple's Pro Display, which was the reason that everyone lost their minds when it arrived for just $6,000, because it had the opportunity to replace $40,000 reference monitors thanks to its 1600 nits of peak brightness. Of course, there were some questions later, as the 512 local dimming zones meant that it wasn't quite the precision that everyone wanted, but a couple of years later, and the MacBook Pros have 2,500 dimming zones, and that's in a laptop that costs under $2,000 to start with. The speed that technology improves is kind of mind-blowing. Next up, Dropbox has decided to support Apple Silicon after a rough day, but it's kind of Apple's fault that we're here. Yesterday, it came to light that Dropbox, the cloud file storage and sharing people, whatever, I'm guessing you know what Dropbox is, is still running Intel code via Rosetta on Apple Silicon Macs and had a vote going on their community pages to decide whether it was worth developing a native Apple Silicon version with their community manager basically saying it wasn't a priority. Now, Rosetta, while effective and offering very respectable performance, is in no way a long-term replacement for native code. It uses more power and saps the battery very quickly, producing more heat. Rosetta 2 is a very impressive piece of software, but it seems like a lot of developers are using it as a crutch to avoid putting in the work needed to develop a native version of their software for the new Apple Silicon architecture, and it's a false economy. Yes, these developers are probably saving a little bit of time on coding by letting Rosetta do the kind of heavy lifting, but increasingly Mac users are moving away from unoptimized software and choosing alternatives from developers who are taking advantage of universal binaries. iCloud is getting more useful and picking up a lot of Dropbox's old features, and Google Drive is already native. Then Drew Houston, the Dropbox CEO, popped up to say they're absolutely supporting Apple Silicon and the release should be in the first half of next year. Seems a bit late, but of course better late than never. And he also said that most of the team working on Dropbox using MacBooks. Of course, in the meantime, there are alternatives that do the same, although, as I say, I'm kind of in the Dropbox habit, having used it for at least the past seven years. But what does Apple need to do? Put an end date on Rosetta 2, or at least an end OS. I think uh, that it should probably be OS Monterey. Any apps being submitted to the App Store now, or even getting updated, should require a universal binary. That would push developers to do the work, because right now the issue is that Rosetta performed so well that a lot of developers thought there was no need to optimise. If Apple says the next version of macOS won't support Rosetta 2, but does support universal binaries, then the existing Intel Macs are safe, but all the new apps and updates will be compatible with the latest Macs natively. Will there be a handful of apps that fall by the wayside because they don't have an active developer team? Yes, but that's okay. Others will pick up the slack. And this isn't something that will adversely affect those using Intel Macs. Universal binaries will still include everything they need. It just means that those using the current models with Apple Silicon won't suffer poor battery life because the developers couldn't be bothered. And if anyone has a particular piece of software that they must, must, must use, there's always the opportunity of staying on the current operating systems and not upgrading to the next version unless you can kind of push the developers to actually update those apps and the cushions now i want to point out this isn't a sponsored segment but i just think that these are awesome throwboy has been making awesome apple and tech pillows for a long time and they've recently branched out into t-shirts like the one i'm wearing now yesterday they launched a kickstarter for some of the most awesome pillows i've ever seen and they hit their funding goal in the first hour so these things are happening which is just awesome. But I wanted to share them with you, and I reached out to their team who said I could share their video today. So if you want to see that, I'll include it in full at the end of this video after the iCave answers. Again, this isn't a sponsorship, but I just think Roberto and the team are doing an amazing job with these. And if you got this far through the video and you aren't a subscriber already, please hit that uh, button for me. It makes me really happy. First question comes today from uh, Rob. Ooh, IK Vances. How do YouTubers who do MacBook Pro reviews install all those test benchmark paid programs like Final Cut Pro, Logic Pro, Premiere Pro, Adobe Suite, etc., on multiple MacBooks? Do they pay the license and for each install on each MacBook? Or are there single programs available to be installed on multiple MacBooks without having to pay a license fee for each install? So that's a really good question. Um, if they are using MacBooks and they're using uh, an Apple ID that they're using on all of these, things like Final Cut Pro goes with your Apple ID. So you're licensed it to your Apple ID so you can install it on whatever Macs that you're using at the time. Most of these reviewers won't be keeping all of these Macs, so it'll be removed and they'll either be returned or sold on 
that sort of thing. Same with Adobe Suite. Normally you get a license for up to two machines, I think, uh, but it's two machines at a time. So there's always the opportunity to install it on one, then remove it, then put it onto another one, then remove it. So that's basically what they do as far as I can tell. Although I think you can actually have it physically installed on multiple systems and just move the license as you're using them in different places. James Apple, is it safe to say your M1 Pro Mac Mini is coming to the Spring Loaded event or at the end of the year at Christmas? I gave answers. I don't think any of those things are safe to say, unfortunately. Um, I would love for it to come uh, this side of Christmas. Whether it will or not, I don't know, but that's what my belief is. If we don't see it before then, I think, yeah, spring is probably a decent uh, shape. Also from James Apple, is the 27 inch iMac sounding more like an iMac Pro? Because it has an M1 Pro and M1 Max chip, and a mini LED display and probably a 5K display, speculating this. I feel like it fits the bill for a Pro machine. I'm gonna say I hope they don't call it iMac Pro because iMac Pro as a name makes no sense. The I at the beginning of names was purely there to say this is a consumer device. That's what it meant. That's why we had iBooks and iMacs. Uh, they were the two consumer devices, and then you had uh, Power Macs and Power Books were the pro machines back in the day. So the i at the beginning should mean consumer, not pro. The iMac, if you just put fast stuff in it, pros will use it. It doesn't need to be called pro for people to understand that they can use it in a professional way. Also, I would assume they're going to go more than 5K. I would guess we're going to get to 6K for this. Uh, we went 4 to 4.5 on the smaller ones. So I would guess we'll probably go to 6K, but maybe 5K is where we stay. Lite asks, IK answers, AirPods 3 versus AirPods Pro versus Beats Flex versus Beats Studio Buds versus AirPods 2. So again, not really much of a question, but this is more of a let's compare these things. So AirPods 3 is obviously the one that I've just picked up recently. I really, really love them. Um, AirPods Pro, basically AirPods 3, but with silicon tips and uh Active noise cancellation is the only big difference now. Uh, Beats Flex is very much the entry point. I think they've gone up to $69, though. They were $49. Um, that's a little bit interesting. Uh, Beats Studio Buds, they're great for listening to stuff. Terrible for making calls on. The microphones in them absolutely suck. And AirPods 2, great bargain buy now, $129. Team Kinetics. iCave answers, as unified memory operates differently to conventional RAM and Apple Silicon unified memory has such a massive memory bandwidth, how much difference and in which tasks would you likely see a real world difference between 16 gigabytes and 32 gigabytes on an M1 Pro MacBook Pro? So it's not going to make much difference in individual apps unless you are doing absolutely massive files um, for example, uh, musicians that do ridiculous amounts of virtual instruments um, that need to all be able to play simultaneously, that all kind of needs to be loaded into RAM, I think, into the unified memory. Uh, in most cases, though, like with 8 gigs on my Mac Mini, I've seen no bottlenecks. Absolutely zero. The only time I ever have a problem is when Chrome is running and it just gobbles up all of the uh, all the stuff. The other thing tends to be ads in certain blogs, uh, things like uh, Patently Apple is really terrible for it. 95 Mac is quite bad. Um, a lot of the kind of Apple blogs, because they're trying to uh, monetize through advertising, they're really bad for it. But I'm not going to install an ad blocker because these guys are doing their work. They need to be paid for it. That's the way that it all works. So um, I just don't keep the pages open longer than I need to. But bear in mind as well that this unified memory is also your VRAM. So this is what is uh, feeding your GPUs as well. The more you get, the more performance you will probably have and the more kind of deep uh, rendering you can have if we get to the point where um, AAA games come to the Mac. Having that extra unified memory will also spill over onto your graphics performance. Charles Bath asks, I gave answers. Do you think a 2015 MacBook Pro 15 inch and a 2014 Mac mini have got their last operating system upgrade? Now, this sounds very specific to you, and I'm going to say um, I'm sorry, but I think they probably have. Um, I think Apple does need to kind of cut the cord with Intel quite soon. Um, I think we'll probably get another version, at least another major version of Mac OS that supports Intel all the way through. But, uh, but I think it's going to be... Um, a little bit more aggressive in the devices that get cut uh, as we go forward. So yeah, I think this is probably, at least for the Mac Mini, its last chance. Okay guys, that's it for the questions. I'm going to play you that Kickstarter video now and I will see you in the next one. Don't forget as well, we've got our desk tour coming up at 5pm UTC, 6 UK time. See you then. Hello, Kate.
Kickstarter. My name is Roberto and I'm the founder and CEO of Throwboy. And this is the Iconic Pillow Collection 2. The Iconic Pillow Collection 2 is a set of five cuddly throw pillows inspired by the most beloved, craziest, swing for the fences designs in tech history. Adding to our original Iconic Pillow Collection released in 2018 on Kickstarter, I've put together this brand new set of throw pillows that I know you're going to love. These five throw pillows are by far the most crazy, the most intricate pillows I have designed to date. Each premium 3D throw pillow has an attention to detail not found on any other product like it. Right now, the Iconic Pillow Collection 2 is available only on Kickstarter. When you back this project, you'll get your choice of one, two, three, four, or all five of these super soft premium throw pillows. Since starting Throwboy in 2007, it's fans like you that have allowed me to create these incredible, intricate, crazy throw pillows for fans just like us. I'm super proud of this collection and I thank you for inspiring it. I cannot wait for you to get it in your hands. Let's help bring this project to life.